Good morning. Here we are 19 days before the elections with Ben Davis, U of Toledo Law School professor, Jim Alfini, Dean and Professor Emeritus from Northern Illinois Law School and Southern South Texas Law School, and Jeff Portnoy, our leading First Amendment constitutional scholar here in Hawaii. Gentlemen, lots of possible topics today. Ben, thanks for sharing an absolutely magnificent article. Do you want to give us just a quick intro of what you're talking about with that? Um, yeah, just real quick was um, I was watching the uh, Judge Barrett uh, confirmation hearings and I heard her mention herself as being a, uh, as Justice Scalia being her mentor and that she was an originalist. And so that caused my old originalist question to pop up in my head that I always ask them because I have an ancestor or I have ancestors who were enslaved and owned by one of the founders and framers of families, the Harrison family, Benjamin Harrison, uh, William Henry Harrison, who ended up being a president long after. And so what I usually would ask originalists uh, as my objection, as opposed to the usual ones, was just, what if you have a personal objection to a founder or framer because they owned your ancestor? And the other part of it was also, uh, I found out later on from my sister that it's not just that he owned them, that I actually have his DNA in me. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's how deep it was. And uh, so that's a, I, I wrote to a piece that that's a question I'd like her to answer. I did once ask Justice Scalia that question and a uh, big dinner, 400 people at the Inverness Club here in Toledo when he came. And uh, the back and forth was kind of fun and that he first said to me, well, the people made the constitution. Of course, everyone says, people, what do you mean? It was uh, white men with property, right? I mean, so there's a lot of people who are not white men with property at that time. And, uh, and then he said, well, I should man the barricades, you know, be in the streets like uh, May 68 in Paris. And I was uh, an untenured law professor at the time. And I'm like, I'm a law professor, you know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, radical in the street. And he said, well, you have to be logical. And uh, so that was fine. So I, you know, I stopped the back and forth. With the back and, forth. and then he said, which I think was really interesting, you've got to get over slavery to me like that. And the resounding applause by the at, at the time. And, uh, but on the way out, and I'm here in Toledo, this white couple said to me, he, uh, he didn't answer your question. And uh, the wife of a judge who's at, my, at the same table as me, she spoke to me with very strong emotion and pride about her great grandfather who had fought for the union during the Civil War. And it so moved me, actually, I was driving to DC once, I stopped at Gettysburg to see the ghosts, which is incredible. Gettysburg is incredible. And I went into a little store there and bought a, a, a US Army belt buckle, which was made in China, but you know, uh, which was uh, because she said that he had gotten shot, but what had saved him is that his belt buckle had, had blocked the Confederate bullet. So I, was, I sent that to her sort of in remembrance of it. But well, you know, Comey, Comey Barrett is not really an originalist. What she should call herself is a federalist. Yeah. And, and that's why these hearings have gone a little bit off the rail. Uh, you know, I mean, this was, a, as we all know, a fait accompli. But getting into the weeds on originalism and, and uh, how the Constitution is to be interpreted, what they should do and should have done, and some tried, was get into the Federalist Society, her membership in that society, her adherence to all of their politics, positions and legal uh, positions, I think the country would have been a little bit better served understanding really where she's coming from. Hey, yeah. That's a good idea. And where yeah. is that? Well, I mean, you know, I think what we have now are literally, I don't know how many hundreds of judges who have been uh, nominated by the Federalist Society. I mean, they have provided Trump with lists 
from district courts to the Supreme Court, and he is nominated off of those lists. There, I don't know if there's more than 100. There could be 200 uh, judges sitting now who are members of the Federalist Society. And it's a very, uh, let me be charitable, a very conservative organization uh, whose views probably follow those of uh, uh, Ben's relatives, uh, <laughs> indirect relatives who, uh, who own plantations back in the mid 1800s. I think that's the most charitable way to put it. I mean, they're anti-gay, they're anti-voting rights, they're anti-women's uh, uh, rights. I mean, they are, they are going back to uh, the 1770 in their views of uh, what the law should be. I mean, that's really a common way of saying it. You guys probably have a much more uh, intellectual way of defining who they are. Yeah, they were, they were founded in the, in the 1970s, and Justice Scalia was one of the uh, one of the founders, so one of the originators of the Federalist Society. I think it's probably best to see them as a reaction to the Warren era. Um, you know, the Warren court uh, and the even the Burger court to some extent extended the rights of the accused. Um, we had Roe versus Wade. Um, and all of a sudden these people said, hey, wait a minute, let's put the brakes on this. And originalist is, you know, part of their their thinking. The problem I have with that term, I think, is that it really is an extreme way of looking at the Constitution, as Ben so uh, carefully, you know, pointed out in his piece. Um, and there are conservative justices. A, a good example would be Souter and uh, O'Connor uh, and Kennedy. Um, that really don't subscribe to the originalist thing. I mean, I remember when we were holding our breaths that Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned. Uh, and then Casey came out and those three got together. And I think basically what they said was, we have to be concerned about the integrity of the institution. This has been decided. People have relied on it. Um, and so, you know, maybe we can quarrel a little bit about the reasoning, but we can't overturn the basics. And I think that's, that's uh, institutional integrity um, it, it is where the justices all should be. And I don't think Barrett is there. I mean, she's too much. She's, she's I think, maybe even more than Scalia. I think she'll, she'll, She'll bond with Thomas on the court. Hey, and hey, Jim, you have been long one of the leading people in the American Bar Association uh, on ethics. And if my recollection is correct, and not that long ago, you and the ABA Ethics Commission had uh, somewhat of an encounter with the Federalist Society judges. Want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, actually, I wasn't directly involved in this, but um, the there there's a um, uh, a committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, which means federal judges, that basically makes changes to the Code of Judicial Conduct for federal judges, the U.S. Judges Code of Judicial Conduct, and they had put out a memo recommending a, prov a new provision that would have said that federal judges could not be members of the Federalist Society or the American Constitution Society because they took basically stood for political um, things. Uh, at, and at the same time, they said the American Bar Association is OK because it's a more neutral, a neutral body. Uh, Jeff, this is where the Federalist Society comes in. Over, they got a, a petition from, I want to say, about 300 federal judges who all said that they were members of the Federalist Society and they were outraged that they would have to, to quit the Federalist Society. The moral of that story is they, they didn't withdraw it, but they basically put it on hold. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know whether he is or isn't, so I'm not making a statement, but our chief judge 
here uh, actually talk to me about that uh, because of the First Amendment ramifications. Um, I never asked him, nor did he say whether he was a member, uh, but he was, he was very outraged by what you're talking about and the attempt to uh, force judges to uh, not be members of the Federalist Society. So it, it hit home even a little bit here in Hawaii. Mm. Yeah. yeah, right. And Mark Bennett's a member, so he's a Ninth Circuit judge. Oh, is he? I didn't know that. He, he is indeed. He was one of the signatories to the letter of outrage. I would let, I'll tell you all, I have the uh, Federalist Society t-shirt because one of my students bought me a membership. Uh, no, not, this was after grades were in. <laughs> 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 for, for a year there, I was, and I'd sell him for his birthday. I would buy him a membership in the ACLU, which... <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, there is a legitimate argument about what the role of judges are. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think I think you can make an argument both ways. I mean, you know, there are judges who say their job is simply to uh, interpret the law as written, uh, whether they like it or not. And then there are the other side that say, no, courts are uh, supposed to... Uh, uh, expand the law if they believe the law is unjust or, you know, how they interpret the Constitution literally or not. Um, and unfortunately, I think we are seeing uh, a, a significant influx, right, of those judges at the federal level who are uh, federalists or originalists and who believe that uh, they're not there to make law. And uh, you know, if you can't get the, the second branch of government to change the legislature, the law, that's just the way it is, right? And they, they look at the constitution the way it was written and claim if you don't like it, that's why there's a way to amend the constitution. So, you know, I, I think the three of us probably feel differently about what the role of judges should be, but lots of people who, who believe the contrary. But if you look at the if you look at the opinions of a lot of those federalist oriented judges, there's no doubt in my mind that they're making policy. That's BS <laughs> that they're that all they're doing is applying the law. That's, yeah. that's bullshit. Good example is our we, uh, we started early voting here in Texas this week um, and record turnouts, by the way. Um, but at the same time, our governor. Greg Abbott, who's a Trump ally, um, uh, reduced the number of, he basically shut down dozens of um, drop-off points for um, uh, mail-in ballots. Um, and basically what he decreed was there's only going to be one per county, one drop-off point. Per, well, some of the Texas counties are as big as the state of Rhode Island. So it'd be hard for a lot of people to get to that point. Um, and so they brought suit and a federal district judge actually said that he was uh, suppressing, that, that it was unconstitutional, that he was denying some people the right to vote. He was suppressing uh, voting. It goes on appeal to the Fifth Circuit and a three judge Fifth Circuit panel overrules the district judge and upholds the governor's order. All three were Trump appointees. So, <laughs> you know, I, unless I, you live unless you live in California, Jim, where the Republican Party are putting drop boxes on every other corner and then collecting the ballots themselves, or just, yeah, that's what? right. It's unbelievable. The only real evidence of voter fraud in the first month of voting is the Republican Party in California putting out their own phony drop boxes. It's, right. it's, it's what so else could happen? Official. And they what had the word official happen? on them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the, the Secretary of State writes the cease and desist letter, which I think is supposed to end at five, you know, the, the, the timing of that is five o'clock this evening, right? Okay. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, you should maybe do like Michigan. Remember those guys in Michigan who were making those robocalls to people by saying, if you vote, you know, by mail, you're going to be put on the list and all that stuff. So what do they do in Michigan? 
criminally charge him. Boom, you know. And I'm saying, when I looked at that happening, when the the party says, "Oh, we're not going to listen to your cease and desist order," it's like, well, why don't you just charge him? Just bring the case. Bring the case. Get, you know, get go. You know, this whatever the the uh, chair of the party is, arrest them. The states and local have been left on their own, and the federal response has been appalling. Yeah, but they interviewed, they interviewed, and you know, I watched CNN last night and, and also MSNBC, no surprise. They interviewed a few people, uh, you know, at, at this Trump place in Pennsylvania. And this is no different than what I've seen for weeks now about going to these rallies. And, you know, one person, and I know they represent lots of people say it's in God's hands. I'm not worried. And then someone else says, hey, if I get it and I die, I die. I mean, it's these yeah. are these are millions of Americans. It's unbelievable. <laughs> well, you know, uh, just on on the the God's hands thing. You know, I always I've been waiting for somebody to say to them, you know, God created Corona too. <laughs> you know, so uh, I guess that was that would. God... He only he only did it to strike down the sodomites. Oh, that's what it was. Is that well, so? You know, that's the other. One. Oh, this... no Republicans are supposed to be getting sick. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, That's right. Uh, if, you, if you're right, in God's yeah. mind, right. <laughs> Jay, if you're right, and I hope you are, that it's going to be Biden Harris, um, at least those are two people that I think have the capacity to heal some wounds and develop a consensus. What do you think? I don't, I don't see it, Jim. I, I think they, they're the right people, but, but, you know, you just watch those rallies and it's like, it's like they've all been brainwashed. It's like Hitler. I mean, I'm sorry to say it. It's like Hitler. You watch the old film of the 1930s into the early 1940s of the Hitler rallies or some of the Soviet Union rallies. Right. They're Mussolini. no different. They're yeah. no different. The yeah. people are, are, <laughs> It's mind boggling to me. CNN went and interviewed um, yesterday. I don't know if you saw it in Pennsylvania. They went to a rural community, a rural county that voted for Trump. And some woman, 2016, built a little house, which she now calls the Trump house, uh, where she sells Trump paraphernalia. And they interviewed her. And she said, oh, in 2016, people found this novel and whatever. She goes, you can't believe how many people have come through. She had a book this thick of signatures and they showed the line stretching as far as I could see for people to walk through the Trump house to buy a Trump t-shirt, a hat or whatever. Jim, I, I, I don't know how you're going to do it. I, I just think, I just think, I think it's the civil war without the war. Yeah. Well, my, my wife thinks I'm an uncurable romantic, but <laughs> I, I like to remember those moments during, during the most heated protests, Black Lives Matter versus skinheads, um, where they caught on tape um, someone, from Black, someone with a Black Lives Matter shirt debating um, you know, a, a Proud Boys uh, guy and they wound up shaking hands at the end. I think it's possible. It's tricky, but I think people can get together. To some extent, they're angry about the same things, you know? So what is gonna happen with Trump, do we think, when he's gone? Do we think he's gonna shrink into the background like Bush or like, you know, Obama? Or is he gonna be out there uh, you know, stirring up his, his base. I, I don't think so. I don't, I mean, he is an If he doesn't get convicted, by the way, yeah. Go ahead. Right, That's right. true. He's going to be out there worrying about that. Yeah. But I, I think he is, there's no doubt that he is an, able, an enabler of hate. But he does it for only one reason, and that's to get elected. When and that's off money. the table, the money. he know. doesn't really have a reason to be out there doing that. Right. You know? Right. Well, I'm figuring there'll be Trump TV. That's what I think is what's what's going to happen because it's, he had, the adulation is just too strong for him, and he can make money doing it. That's where he made some big good money. Uh, so I don't know if it's inside of Fox or somebody else, but 
he's going to find a way to be a commentator. That's do we have a do we have a two party system come January? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, now will the, will the Republicans remain as rabid as they are right now? You know, sure, sure, but. I, I'm not, I'm, you know, we've had a lot of bad times in history, right? So it's like, things will change, things will change. You could say that in a way that it's only 40% of the country, you know, imagine if this was 80% of the country was like, right? Well, then, that's then, progress. then, then the four of us would be in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or New Zealand. Well, I've, never, right. I've never been a big fan of the two party system. I know that no. that sounds like sacrilege, but, um, I wish that some of these third parties would gain some traction. Yes. Yeah. Particularly I, like the Green Party. You know, yeah. it's been there. It's it's hanging in there. You know, if you get some charismatic leaders in that party, they haven't had any. Um, yeah. You know, having a third or fourth party, I think, might be a, a healthy thing. I don't know, yeah. Jake. Those third parties cost us Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> But the state structures, the, the oh. state bipartisan structures that are basically killing third party candidates by making the hoops they have to go through to get on the on the ballot so incredibly complex, you know, just because it's like a Democratic and Republican game, so to speak. And that's something that's bothered me a lot over the years, the not being allowing really, I don't know how it would be done, but just, okay, if you want to run, you get your signatures and you do it but you don't put people through so many hoops and then you have a free for all. And then you end up who ends up wherever they do, you know? So gentlemen, in our last minute, final thoughts, we're going to come back just before the election on October 29th and revisit this. And we can talk more about voter suppression and which communities are targeted and what impacts it will really have. But last thoughts. Vote. Vote. Oh. Yes. And we should have had a stimulus before the SCOTUS. That's what I think is a sacrilege. And that is the biggest problem I have with the confirmation hearing, is they didn't get the stimulus done before. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your time, for your thoughts, for this really dynamic interactive discussion. We will be back in two weeks on the eve of the election to talk about what are we all confronted with then. Thank you all. Stick around for a little debriefing.